please welcome to stage a very funny, the hilarious Nick Reynoldson. Nick Reynoldson is a very smart and funny stand-up comedian who hails from just outside of Toronto, Ontario. The co-host of the popular Talking Raptors podcast, Nick is currently in the running to win Sirius XM's Top Comic Contest, which would crown him the best comic in Canada and earn him a cash prize and slots at Just for Laughs festivals around the world. You can hear Nick doing some jokes at the end of this episode, and then, if you like, you can vote for him as many times as is humanly possible until August 17th, 2018. You can learn more about that at topcomic.seriousxm.ca slash comic slash Nick hyphen Reynoldson. Now, I've seen Nick live a few times, and we recently connected for a conversation about his upbringing in Scarborough, which is just outside of Toronto, and what it was like to be raised by his interracial parents and their parrot, his views on the state of comedy in Toronto and Canada. What's up with the Toronto Raptors right now? They made a bunch of big changes in the offseason. What's going on with the Raptors? And we talked about other things, too. With in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, and, of course, listeners like you who make flexible monthly pledges at patreon.com slash Control, download episodes, and ask your pals to subscribe to this podcast just like you do. This is the 417th episode of Creative Control featuring Nick Reynoldson with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Uh, thank you guys so much, man. Hi Nick, how are you? I'm fantastic. Vish, how are you doing? I'm I'm pretty well. I'm pretty well. It's a it's a nice morning here in Guelph. Where in the world are you? I'm in uh, downtown Queen West, Toronto. Oh, that is a a bustling place. Normally, is that where you live? Uh, it's where my girlfriend lives. I'm staying with my girlfriend. I live in Scarborough, which is um, I like a lot better, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You like Scarborough better than Queen West. Especially in the mornings. I like waking up and going outside and not really like seeing people. Mm -hmm. You can't, Queen West is, it's a disaster. It's thousands of people everywhere. Yeah, uh, Queen West has been uh, become, I don't know what part of Queen West you're at exactly, but it's it's becoming or has, be, it's been gentrified, right? That's fair to say? Um, yes, that's more than fair to say, absolutely. In the process of being gentrified, it's just con it just seems to be constantly in gentrification mode uh I, I i would say and and you're from scarborough you know i i have spent a considerable amount of time in scarborough because all of my cousins and aunts and uncles obviously are in that that's where they all came from india they went there and yeah my parents settled in cambridge which is about an hour from from you so we would just drive there almost every weekend and i i just i i kind of like what part of scarborough are you are you in exactly brimley and finch Okay, uh, we would be like on, um, I, I, we would take, a, I guess, McCowan Boulevard to yeah. something, and then uh, uh, and then uh, my other sets of aunts and uncles lived off of Markham Road. Oh, yeah, we're all in and around the same same area. Right same now. area, yeah. So what was it like growing up in Scarborough? Uh, it was the best. I mean, just like the most multicultural way you could bring up. I mean, different cultures, like all my friends were all different backgrounds, and and all the food was different. You got to learn about everyone from an early age. Like it was, uh, it had a big part of like why I'm very accepting to everyone. I guess kind of growing up, I'm not like not thinking anyone's weird because I've like I've seen everything weird. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, just to clarify for people who want to home in on what you're saying about other cultures being weird, because <laughs> yeah, this day and age that uh, that's maybe problematic. But you yourself, uh, let's just let's I'll I'll, I'll join you. In the kind of you know problematic speech, you have a, a weird <laughs> cultural background too, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I have a weird cultural background. What, what is and your... it gets weirder when you break it down, and that's what I mean by weird. Where where weird, I just meant like f like like uh, foreign to me. Yeah, no, even foreign sounds problematic. It's not good, Beach. We didn't start good. No, yet. we we. This is not. We're gonna get in trouble for this. What What is your foreign background? I can't believe I just said that. What is your <laughs> What is where are your parents from? I suppose is the easiest way to put this. Okay, so um, so my I'll, I'll start off with <laughs> my mom is from <laughs> my mom is from Guyana. <laughs> your mom is from Guyana. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my dad, he's just from Canada, but uh, his family's from England. 
so he came he came over when he was like a little kid. My mom uh, came to Canada when she was maybe like eighteen or something like that. Um, and what I mean by weird is like, so we came to Scarborough and there's all these different cultures too. And I, I'm like, I'm a mixture of both cultures. So they didn't really know how I was supposed to be raised. Right. Um, and then that extended to my father's not religious, but my mom is Hindu. But my mom was like, oh, you need to have some sort of religion. So she sent me to a Christian church. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I got old enough to realize like, what was, I'm like, you're not even Christian. This is so weird. I just stopped going to church. <laughs> That's interesting. She didn't want to, to pass on the Hinduism. She thought you should, what, integrate? I, just, I, I literally think there was just because there was a, a church closer than there was a temple. And she's like, well, you're, you're going here now. So did, you, did she practice? Did you have, like, when I grew up, there were pujas and things, you know, gatherings of people for religious ceremonies. Or we'd have to go there and sit cross-legged while people, yeah. people sang and stuff like that. She, so she, because she was, like, the youngest one of, uh, of her family, she kind of, like got lost in that shuffle where she didn't really, she doesn't really know everything. Like still had pujas and jandies and things like that. Not at our house, but definitely every, all, all my family's house. Mm. Um, yeah, so, she has, so, she has 13 you, siblings. So there's a oh lot. Oh my goodness. Of, really? Yeah. How many are, yeah. how many are here? Um, majority of them. Oh, okay. Not eight or nine are definitely here, and they all have kids and stuff. So I've been to lots of lots of pujas and lots of jandies. That's an interesting thing about uh, families like that, where like in yours and mine, they send a scout over to a different country, <laughs> and they the scout checks it out and says, "Yeah, it's it's okay. You, we can all we can all hang out here." And then yeah. the rest of us show up, or them show up, I should say. Oh yeah, come on! And a lot of times they live in the same house at first, right? And then yeah. they break off and and build empires, man. <laughs> Well, so you had, I think, a somewhat similar upbringing. My both of my parents are from India. Uh, both of them are practicing Hindus, and I ended up kind of. Well, I grew to appreciate the uh, a diversity of my upbringing only in university when people, particularly women, would say, "Oh, you got to eat Indian food. That's a that's amazing. Oh, you, <laughs> you and you you so you grew up with Indian, but that's." That's incredible. I was like, "Oh, this is an asset," I, you know, because <laughs> I so used exotic. to exotic. Yeah, yeah, because I used to like play road hockey. I'm, I didn't realize it, but my, every time I came back from university, uh, or rather from, I'd go. Yeah, when I was in school in university, I'd go home for the weekend. When I came back, my friends would politely say, "Man, you and your laundry really smell like Indian food." I was like, <laughs> oh, oh, "Oh, they, I do." They're like, "Yeah, didn't notice it before, but just from the weekend." So then I started to put it all together and I realized, you know, I would play road hockey after dinner every night because I'm from Canada and I always wondered why I was always open. I was always in the slot and I think it's because <laughs> they found it a little off-putting, the smell of the Indian food. So I, I, that's what I realized after. Like, I, did you have that? Did you, did you resent your upbringing at some point and your cultural background and then grow to appreciate it or were you always uh, of the same mindset about it? I think it was just more, I was more confused as a little kid as to what that, like what I was and, 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 uh, and like who to identify more with, right? Like, cause I grew up, I was way closer with my Guyanese family than I was my dad's family. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that weird thing. And, and, uh, but you know, you're always like, I was always a white kid in my Guyanese family because my mom is the first person to marry like a white guy. Right. So it's just me and my brother. Um, so there was like, I, I was like weirded out to how they, when I got older, I heard stories of, oh, like my mom's family didn't really want my mom to marry my dad. Um, so I, I was like kind of resentful in that way, maybe when I was about like 16, 17. Um, but now I'm like, uh, now I'm cool, man. Now, now I'm not mad at anything. <laughs> well, I've, you know, I've seen you perform many times and you've talked about uh, the fact that your father was particularly white. Or is yes. is particularly white, and 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 I can you expand upon that? What, was that just exemplified when he was at family gatherings, uh, or was it just generally just a white guy? Well, it's like even like like how you were talking about um, your clothes smelling like curry. Like, well, my my mom didn't cook curry that often because my dad didn't like it, right? So, and, but me, but like, especially me, I loved it. So, like, it would be like a special treat, like once a month, where my mom would like make curry right right so, right, right. <clears throat> so you had to, your dad was having trouble adapting to this he was having a, like a cultural clash if you will yeah 
Right. And yeah. so, and so, did, did, and did he come from a large family? Uh, no, he just has one. He has one sister. Right. And they have like a big gap in between them, too. So he's quite, older than she is. Quite different. Quite an unrelatable circumstance. But your parents make it work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, they're still kicking it. They're still together. <laughs> and my, my dad's gotten better. He eats, uh, he eats curry now. It's hilarious to see him like sit down and eat like roti and curry because he'll he'll make it like a burrito and it's so embarrassing right like he he won't use his hands with you know what i mean like yeah, he won't yeah. take a roti with his hands he'll make it a burrito with a fork and then eat it like oh it's like oh, I can't, <laughs> I can't well deal with this. that is particularly white i i don't know what else to say that is a very no, it, white yeah, a, white guy move i would insanely say insanely white guy move yeah now you've all you mentioned that you were a, a weird little kid and i've seen you perform live i've seen you in person you continue to talk about the fact that you feel like a weird little kid uh weird looking all these things are you are you at peace with yourself really nick this is all part of the act you're okay <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm okay like i definitely i had weird I, I never like i always fit in does that make sense like i always had friends i never felt like i was like a loner like not not kind of, but i was like definitely weirder than my friends yeah um and I, I still continue to be weirder than my friends like i i did magic like sleight of hand magic for four years that's that's of my childhood and like i was dedicated to it like a psychopath <laughs> <laughs> well what drew you to magic per se uh, I, th- I guess it was like David Blaine. I, th- I was like, that's the coolest shit I've ever seen in my life. Like, huh. I-, I thought, I definitely thought he was like a strange man. And I'm like, I don't like your personality, sir. It's uh, <laughs> very cold and weird, but uh, I like your magic. Okay. So, you drew- so you- is it fair to say you were always drawn to the performing arts? Like, did you know you wanted to, uh, you know, perform and did you-, you knew you needed that attention, so to speak? Yeah, I was like, I was a theater kid. Uh, oh, were you? In, okay. In my entire high school, yeah. I was in all plays from grade 9 to grade 12, yeah. And sorry, you mentioned your mother's large family. Do you have siblings? I have, uh, yeah, just my, I have a younger brother, a year younger than me, brother. Okay, so you're the older brother. So you weren't, what you weren't, were you drawn to theater and performing for some, you know, desire for attention per se? Like it wasn't something about your home life not getting enough attention? Do you know why, what spurred you into that realm to be like, I need... I need some affirmation from people watching me perform on stage. Like, do you know where that comes from? I mean, I think it, like, I was always, like, I don't know. I always like to make people laugh. And, like, all my family, I remember from a little kid, I used to sing, like, all these weird, I, had a, I, I don't know what, how the song went, obviously, now. But it's a big thing in my family, Vish, that I had a song about roti. Like, when I was a little, little, little kid, like, barely speaking, I had a song about roti. And they would parade me around and make me sing this song about roti. Wow. Um, yeah, I wish I wish I knew how the song went, but uh, something about clapping roti and I, 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 God knows. Um, <laughs> Did you write it? Was it recorded? Someone must have captured this for posterity. It, I, it's got to be on a camera somewhere, uh, right. on VHS somewhere, yeah. some in someone's basement. So it was making um, your family yeah. laugh that that drew you to like, oh, like that's a you had the sensation of making a crowd laugh or 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 applaud. What is that? What happened? Yeah, and it, it was almost like I could. I found out like very young that like you could make someone laugh, and their like tension, like if it was awkward or, if, or if something, you know, uh, uh, there was like tension in the room, you could you could break that with like laughter or or doing something silly or making a face or something. I learned that at very young, and I I like doing that. Okay, and so do you? Were you drawn to other like? Do you remember what influenced that? Like, did you see comedy on TV, or did you encounter stuff, uh, films, or something that where you're like, oh, huh, that guy? I want to be kind of like that, that person, or or do that kind of thing. Uh, my like my dad used to show me up like Monty Python all the time when I was younger, and then I, I think it really like when, when I saw Jim Carrey for the first time. Um, also, that really, also from the area, right? Oh, yeah, hometown boy. Yeah, is he, <laughs> he was from Scarborough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, got... he was very, very poor when he lived in Scarborough. Yeah. So it's and, and Mike Myers is also from Scarborough, right? I believe so. Yeah, weird. Or surrounding area, but yeah, definitely somewhere. Definitely. I believe he's talked about Scarborough. So you got Mike Myers, Jim Carrey, these these Canadian comedy legends, and you realize you're you're from the same place. That's got to be a little man. You must have felt pressure to be funny. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got to be as funny as those guys. <laughs> the funniest guys ever. Yeah. <laughs> now you mentioned Jim Carrey, and I think of your your live show. There is a bit of 
him in there, isn't there? Like that kind of rubbery, like the performative aspect. I'm, I'm not saying you're talking out of your butt or whatever, but yeah, like he, he does have this rubber faced thing where he is expressive in just his face. That I, I, when you mentioned the theater, I assumed it when I thought of your act, when you mentioned that, I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. He's kind of got some acting chops, but the carry thing now crystallizes it a bit more. Did you study him, so to speak? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, unintentionally, right? Like, I was obsessed with it. I thought he was the funniest dude to watch all his movies. Uh, and it definitely, you know, what's hilarious is actually, um, not that you said that rubbery face thing, is all my cousins used to call my brother Jimmy because he also had that rum, rubber face thing. So they're like, oh, Jimmy, right? Jim Carrey. Right. Um, but yeah, we, we both uh, we both did it. And I, I'm like, I, I knew like, from theater that you need to use your face and Jim Carrey was the best at it. And I always like, I, I was always a, an expressive kid with my face. That's yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's quite something to watch you perform. There's a lot of confidence there in your, I, I, I don't I, like your physicality. I, I think that's one thing that some comedians don't necessarily have. They have the material, but they don't have, I guess the stance or the charisma, but you seem very confident on stage. How long have you been doing comedy now? Oh, man, my entire adult life. I think 12 years now, 13. This will be 13. Oh, God, 13 years. <laughs> and do you have some do you have some perspective on how it's evolved from from the earliest days to now? Like, do you sense what I sense that you have a particular conference now that that maybe you didn't have when you were first starting out? Oh, for sure. I was terrible. I was terrible when I first started. I also was like a 20 year old kid who didn't know who who the hell he was or what he was doing or, you know, um, I was so scared of what people thought. And, and especially in stand up, you learn to like, not that, that goes away pretty quickly. If you get serious about it and you want to do it, you just become confident in what you're saying. And like my, so it goes like my mom always told me, she's like, I was always that kid who was super opinionated with family, especially about religion. So I, I used to get in arguments about religion with my family and my mom was kind of like, no, 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 you know, like, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying like, we're trying to have dinner. Can you stop making your uncles angry so everyone can have a good time? Right. So it's kind of like sit down, shut up, smile. And then once I got old enough and like the confidence, I'm like, no, what I say, like my opinions are valid and should be heard. And that's when I kind of stepped into like, yeah, man, I'm confident. I'm going to say what I'm going to say. I'll stand behind it. Do you have a, a any sense memory of a, a, an early joke that clicked where you're like, oh, and maybe even an early performance where you're like, uh-huh, this is, I, I, I know who I am now. I know what my perspective is. Do you have a, a, any memory of those things? Mm, like the, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's like a, a specific <laughs> show when I was like, I got it. I got it. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the first joke that really felt like, oh, like I, I got it. I, I actually wrote this and it, it makes sense now, like after refining it. Huh. Uh-huh. It's a deep question, isn't know. it? It's, yeah, a, it's a deep one. I just a... wonder, like some, we always, they say you always remember your first Nick. So I just wonder if if that's is something that, is it, even if I, it's something that's still with you in your act. Uh, I, I remember my first set ever. And I definitely remember what jokes worked and uh, and how terrible they were. I do remember that, but I don't remember when they were. Um, I don't remember where it switched over. Where I'm like, I want to say this, yeah, as opposed to like I'm saying this because I think you guys are gonna think it's funny. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Like, yeah. I definitely come from. I'm like, this is what I want to say to you because I think it's funny, as opposed to I I think you guys are gonna think this funny. Well, I mean, I, I also, I'm going back to what you're saying about sort of uh, eradicating tension. And, you know, you grew up in Scarborough, which is not, the reputation of Scarborough is that it's kind of a tough place. Did you use comedy to get out of sticky situations? Yeah, absolutely. Like, my, my friends were into some bad shit, some of them, for sure. And, yeah, I, would always make, I could always make people laugh and, like, calm things down and, like, get out of fights. I never, I, like, I had one bully, but I even ended up being his friend. Like, we ended up being friends. Hmm. Never, yeah, I never got, and I was always the smallest kid in the school and never got bullied, man, because I, I was funny. And people, <laughs> people leave you alone if you're, like, like you're, like, I'm a jester, man. They got to keep me around. You want entertainment? Oh, don't, don't kill me, please. I feel like I had that once, actually. I can, I remember a memory of, uh, there was like, a, the bullies always kind of congregated, didn't they? They were kind of a gang. Yeah, oh, yeah. 
Like even when the schools fed into each other, the bullies found each other. I don't know how that worked out. And I remember there was like a, in the new school, there was a guy and he wanted to bully me. But a guy that I went to, I grew up with, he was a bully. But he's like, no, you leave him alone. And I think it's probably because he thought I was kind of funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. It helps. Because sometimes the bullies are jealous of the funny guys because they're smart. The funny people are, are threat because they seem smarter or they act smarter than maybe they even are. Yeah, but you, you, as long as you don't, you can't be condescending with the bullies. You just got to make them laugh and keep them moving and hope you don't get punched in the back of the head. <laughs> so does this, does that mindset uh, impact you when you're doing crowd work or if there's a heckler? I've seen you do crowd work and it's quite magical. I watch it uh, transform into something really, and you're you're very aware of the room. Every time I've seen you, someone maybe emits a sound or, or, or says something and you react to it. You don't ignore it. Um, does that stem from that? background of like i'm gonna listen to these bullies i'm gonna listen to whoever is talking to me and i'm gonna try to make hay out of it that's yeah it's exactly um exactly it and like i i never attack like very i mean i have i definitely lost my temper on people before on stage but uh that's few and far between but i never try to like like you know like attack he, comedian brings down heckler and like that's <laughs> so whack to me like things so crazy yeah um because I'm like, most people that heckle me, they, they're not heckling because they don't like my act. They're heckling because they feel so comfortable with what I'm saying. They're like, oh, I got a bird too. You know what I mean? It's like weird things like that where you're like, how am I going to yell at this guy? Like he's just, in, you know, he's just excited and drunk and spoke out of turn, but he's very pumped. So yeah. I kind of bring that in. I'm like, what did you say? Like make it so everyone can hear it. And, you know, it's it's almost like you let them dig their own grave, right? in front of everybody and you look like a genius as a comedian You're like oh my god he's handling it so well i'm like i really just let that guy talk <laughs> we should maybe clarify for people who uh, aren't familiar with your work uh when you say i have a bird too it's because you have a bird that's because i have a bird you have a parrot yeah. is that right i have a parrot yeah how old is see, this parrot see oh man that's this parrot's got to be i'm 32 so that parrot's got to be whoo 15, 16 years old now? <laughs> 15, 16 years old. Now, I'm familiar with this bit from your from your act, so I don't want to go into it too much, but this is a, a parrot with a, a limited vocabulary on some level, right? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. And, and 15, 16, and you didn't really want, it wasn't a gift for you per se. No, was, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, I'm like, the more I think about it, I'm like, more I'm like, were my parents having marriage trouble and they brought in this goddamn parrot to save them? Like, <laughs> too young to understand what was happening at the time? I don't know. It's still together, so, and the bird's still alive, so maybe it'll work. I've never heard of a bird marriage counselor, but that's, I guess it's possible. <laughs> I had a, I had a budgie, I had a budgie growing up. There's a lot of sort of parallels between you and I, I think that I, I think that's why some of your work resonates with me. I had a, a budgie named Buddy, and he loved me, and I saved his life a couple of times. My sister sat on him once, you know? Oh, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sat on him. With the, what happened was his legs were on either side of a cushion, and she didn't see him. He's a bird. I, I blame him for this. He should have got out of there. But she sat down, and he went between the two cushions, so his legs were kind of up, you Ooh. know? And he was kind of suffocating, and I was like, I, five minutes later, I was like, have you seen Buddy? And she's like, no, I don't know where he is. And then she stood up, and he popped out of the couch he just popped straight up into the air yeah. and his wings were all akimbo and i had to pull his legs anyway the, the bird life people don't appreciate the bird life i thought uh, i loved having a budgie i thought it was a great pet uh we had a, we actually had a budgie before uh the parrot you graduated so, and, from budgie to parrot this they and, went from small bird to big bird yeah i think the the budgie was my, like that was actually my first pet like that was like you're gonna learn how to take care of uh this bird and and it was pretty good. My little budgie, Sasha, she was all right for, uh, I think she lived like five years, man. She did good. Yeah, Buddy was 10, and he he uh, he uh, could say his own name. I taught him to speak. Uh, I don't think, no, my budgie definitely just mimicked sounds still. She didn't <laughs> She didn't speak. None of my birds, I, I don't know what's going on with my, they, my <laughs> none, of my none of my birds. None of my birds is a weird, no one has said that on my show. None of my birds... <laughs> We're very good somehow. I don't know what's wrong with me as a bird person, but my birds weren't great. Uh, well, <laughs> that's that's funny. Now you uh, are you you you're doing comedy in Toronto. I feel like the comedy situation in Toronto 
is in a pretty good place. It has evolved. That's my outsider perspective. What do you make of the Toronto comedy community and the infrastructure? Maybe even are you are you making a living? Are you happy with how things are going? Are there things that could improve? Uh, I mean, it's it's amazing, man. Like it's uh, it really is. You can get on stage and yeah, I'm making a living. Uh, not a great one, but I'm making. Uh, you know, we're doing. It's something I never thought I could do, so I'm I'm very happy to be here. Um, and uh, it's just like, I don't know, man. It's such a strong scene. There's so many amazing comedians uh, in and around Toronto performing every night for free in, in, you know, bars all across the city. It's it's pretty insane. Um, and it's grown since I first started, too. Yeah, it has. It seems to be. I mean, there's now a dedicated, at least uh, like a cool... I think of the comedy bar as a kind of a cool version of a comedy place there's i know there's where where do you perform comedy i don't mean to single out that place i just know that that when that the comedy opened, bar is amazing man uh definitely the comedy bar also I, I don't know if you checked out the corner comedy club i've heard of it i've not been uh he's now he opened his third location in niagara which is pretty the the biggest difference from when i first started comedy and now is the is independent comedy hmm independent comedy wasn't like really a thing like it's it, when i first started it was like if you you better sign with yuck yucks otherwise you're not a comedian right yeah exactly yeah yuck yucks is a kind of a i feel like it has a mixed reputation well when i was like uh f- my first showcase for that mark breslin actually told me to be more guyanese <laughs> in my act <laughs> And did you take that to heart, or were and, you offended? And that's I was I was that's when I was like a twenty year old kid, not not understanding who I was, and still struggling with like trying to be like I don't know if I'm fucking like what am I supposed how am I supposed to be? Yeah. And for him to say that, I was like I'll never work in this club. Oh, you were you were totally offended by it. Yeah, I was like because it was like when Russell Peters was getting big, and I'm like you just want me to do a friggin' accent. That's what you're saying by Guyanese. You want me to do a Guyanese accent? I'm not doing that. Yeah, it's weird when they want the accent. I had an audition for something once, and I was telling a story about my family, and I did it. Well, I did a take of it, and then they said, "Can you? Why don't you? Why don't you do it with an accent?" It's crazy. I'm like Jesus Christ! Like, what the hell? I'm not going to do that. Why would you yeah, say that to me? Yeah, and why? Why do you need an accent in this? This has nothing to do with anything. It's well, so weird. I will say, I don't know if did you have this? I had a thing growing up where I did pander to the whites in my school, and I would do kind of like. You know, I would use the words that I wasn't supposed to use just to... It was almost self-defense. It was like the scene in 8 Mile where Eminem kind of disses himself the whole time. Yeah, yeah. You say say the worst things about yourself before they can, right? Yeah, I undercut myself and my culture just to, you know, make sure that they couldn't do it. Maybe, I don't know. But did you do that at all? Did you kind of, I don't know, put yourself down or your culture down? Not... I mean, other people kind of did it. like, Like, I was half and half, right? So it was like you get shit on for either not being one or you shit on for being both, right? So it was like no win for me and my brother, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also there there weren't a lot of white kids in my school, Vish. Like, I, I man, I can think of three. Oh, my interesting. My entire, like, life, oh, I, okay. honestly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Cambridge, so it was very white. Um, yeah, you t- a lot of white guys. <laughs> yeah, a lot of white people, and I was, and I, I became whiter and whiter and whiter to the point where I'm, basically a white person i mean (laughs) nick you gotta check out my record collection i am more or less a white guy and it's just the way it is i mean i i I, you know i'm first generation i think i'm i'm comfortable with myself now i think i i kind of am sad that my kids aren't going to have as much sort of indian stuff going on because i haven't really pushed it every once in a while i'll use some hindi just like i'll be like chalo let's go like you know let's go it just comes out of me and i'm like why am i I'm turning into my parents. This is so weird. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. I, I. It sounds like you're at peace with yourself in terms of all that stuff as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't have. I don't like. I think the kids thing is like that's a whole nother. Like holy shit, how do I? Like you know, you're trying to take your, your, your personal culture and upbringing and what you find that you've grown and loved and 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 identified with, plus what you know you're your families, which made you find what you found. Does that make sense? Like it all, it's all one and you kind of want to pass it on to your kids. I don't have that for well, my kids. So yeah, I'm but, still stuck on my own. Like, ah, I don't know. All of my girlfriends have been white, which I think is interesting. That's, now. that's Cambridge though. 
I don't <laughs> like. I think you, that's that's what you have to choose from. I mean, like that's what, <laughs> no, there were was, some. There were some, and you know, I could tell. You can also do. I have a thing where like a person of a particularly brown a brown person will in those situations will gravitate. They'll they'll gravitate towards each other a little bit, or kind of do. I used to call it the checkout. The brown right. checkout. They're just like, oh, <laughs> they just size each other up a little bit. And it happens to me all the time. And I'm like, oh, there's a, I notice it, but I've never, I don't know. You're right. Maybe it's the Cambridge. Maybe it's the Guelph. Maybe it's just where I'm at. You, you have had a, a diverse array of relationships is what you're saying. Uh, or implying. A lot, I, I, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, like my family made fun of me in, in growing up because all, uh, my girlfriends were Asian. Oh, okay. And, there you go. And that was uh, like another thing because I'm like that. That's the it's a population thing. I, I <laughs> yeah, don't, totally demographics. It's like, yeah, it's a numbers game, man. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not preference. It's just like yeah, it's so, how it works out. So Breslin says this thing to you, and you're like, you know, yuck yucks can whatever. Uh, yeah, I'm not dealing with that. But you do incorporate aspects of your culture. You're just not doing accents and stuff, but you do, you're do. you not shying away from your heritage. You talk about your heritage. Absolutely, yeah. Well, it, it, it's uh, it's a like, big part of me, right? Like, I, I grew up around only Guyanese people, so it was, uh, in, in, like, in my mom's family, right? There was, it was, and I was there all the time. Uh, so when he saw your act, were you doing that? I don't think I was, no. There I, you I, go. I, I, I wonder. I was t- talking about, uh, man, maybe he meant it, uh, you know what? Thanks, Mark Breslin. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm actually serious. Maybe that was like you were initially putting it off, but maybe subconsciously it got to you a little bit. Like beyond uh, making you angry, maybe you're like, you know, it just sort of you're saying it naturally happened. You just started to explore your culture a bit more in your work. Yeah, I think so. And also, you know, it, it was the Russell Peters thing. Oh, you, you, uh, you because you, Russell was yeah. huge at that time when I like and and he, he did all Indian accent, right? Like, so I was like, I'm not doing. Yeah, I'm not I, doing an accent, man. Yeah, I quite dislike him. Is he revered in the Toronto comedy community? Is he? I know he's successful, but what do you have any opinions on him? Uh, As a brown comedian or a beige comedian, if you will. Uh, I mean, he's like the first like superstar, right? Like that, he's humongous. But uh, right now in the comedy community, is like uh, he's kind of getting outed for stealing a bunch of jokes now. So it's not a uh, right. He's not revered, no. Um, but I mean, like, God damn it, man. He, he is, he is very good at what he does, uh, and very rich. So <laughs> I have to respect good. that on some level. Good for him. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you know, he's, he's a stand up comic. I got like, he, he tours arenas. So at some point you have to be like, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he hasn't done well. Are you, uh, are you, did you follow like his Juno hosting stuff like he just seems to be a controversial fellow now and he seems to make odd decisions when he's in front of a national or international audience i find he, sh- he shouldn't host uh anything like he, he shouldn't, <laughs> just, he shouldn't that shouldn't be a thing like, <laughs> i think comedians are in a weird position where when they do you actually think com- i've talked about this with comedians a lot lately about this 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 current moment in time it's a very sensitive moment in time so if you're a comedian and used to pushing the envelope on some level, do you do you sense that? Do you sense that it's a bit more difficult to do that in this day and age where everyone is being a bit, certainly being more sensitive to what people are saying and doing, but also more outspoken about it? Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely harder to do. It's But I think when you do it and you do it right, the payoff is that much greater because mm-hmm. it was it's such a tightrope walk now, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I know you're very immersed in in Toronto life, and and I want to ask you not the magazine. Sorry, I meant <laughs> life in Toronto. You have a, a podcast about the Raptors, right? I do. Yes. What What's the podcast called? It's called Talking Raptors, and uh, I co-host that with Barry Taylor. And and who is Barry? Barry uh, is a comedian, and he's the founder and I guess CEO of Comedy Records. Right, which is based in Toronto and and very prolific. There seems to be, there seem to be many releases on on the comedy records uh, imprint. Uh yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, the biggest one in Canada. Uh, it's crazy. It was like that. None of that existed when I first started comedy. So for Barry to come and like start this seven years ago, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, build we built this from the ground up. Uh, it's it's pretty crazy. Where it's like, it's a 
thriving company now that has connections in New York and Miami now. So yeah, no, it's doing very well, and I and, and obviously you're saying it, it, or I think you were saying that you do you feel it, it filled a void. There was nothing like it was going on here. No, nothing, nothing like it was going on. It definitely, it definitely filled a void, and 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 uh, it like uplifted independent comedy and kind of gave. It kind of gave. Uh, there's a lot more independent comedians now. Yeah, who, who don't want to sign with Yuck Yucks? Like, right. there's not. They don't care about it anymore, and that w- just was impossible when I started. And and I will say, I should say that uh, in because I think of Barry's efforts, and there's lots of kind of advocacy for stand up in Canada right now. Uh, and recently, this year, I believe, might have been the first. Is it the first year the Juno Awards had a stand up comedy category? Uh, it's a, it, they or had it some time. Yeah. yeah like they kind of got rid of it. 20 years, 20 right. years or something like that. Yeah. So they have a, and, and is, is that fair to say it's largely because of people like Barry who were like, Hey, like what the hell? Why don't you have a comedy award category? Oh, absolutely. Like they champion for that pretty, uh, pretty hard guys like Ben Miner from, uh, XM. Uh, those guys push really hard and, and, and they were a work, man. It worked. Yeah. Okay. So there's something going on. Uh, can- Canadians and the infrastructure seems to be appreciating comedy. Now there's a push for, we have many granting agencies here in Canada for the arts. Uh, I would say that's that's fair to say many, but the primary ones are like the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts. They have not uh, really, and, and you know, it's music, theater, dance, film, all sorts of categories, but now there's a push for comedy, right? To try to get that kind of funding. Yeah, to get well. Right now, uh, stand-up comedy is not even recognized as an art form, right, in Canada. Yeah, what the hell? Why? Why? How is that possible? Given I don't know. We've I, I, talked I, about Mike Myers. We talked about Jim Carrey, Kids in the Hall. There's uh, Lauren Michaels for crying out loud. There's a yeah. rich history of cutting-edge comedy from this country. And why? How is that possible? Do you have a perspective on that? Why? Why is comedy not taken seriously in the? Why is nothing that we make? in Canada taken seriously by Canadians until an American takes it seriously. I don't get it. Uh, we're all have that inferiority complex. I think I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure why you're from Scarborough. Uh, you should know the answer to this somehow. I don't know what that means, but I just yeah. feel like your perspective on the world is, is important. And for this huge question, um, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I know why stand up, like stand up itself, is like I, I, I know why that's not considered an art form. Not it's it's it should be, but it's like stand up is the only thing, like this is the only art that you can kind of watch and be like, I, I could do that. You know what I mean? Like you have two drinks, you're like I could, I'm funnier than this guy. You know what I mean? You're never you're never really at like a play or something. You're like ah, I can do that scene better than this idiot. You know what I mean? Like. So it lends itself to like, oh, it's just some drunk idiot talking into a microphone. How's that art? It's so weird to me because I think of the smart, a really smart, great comedian, I think is potentially the smartest person in any room. Uh, I don't know. That's just my instinct now. I, I really think coming up with a way to make people laugh is uh, is really out of nothing. You know, just creating yeah. something that makes people have an involuntary visceral reaction is really remarkable. And I can't think of many people who, you know, just creating it yourself and performing it yourself. Like, I don't understand how this is not taken more seriously. That's my thing. I I agree with you. I'm glad you agree, because if you didn't, we'd be in trouble. I mean, you're a comedian, well, I, for crying out loud. I'm, try, I'm trying to get back into the magic game, Vish. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Magicians are something else. Anyway, we kind of I went on a tangent there and a slight rant. But tell me more about your Talking Raptors podcast. That was the point of this. What do you guys do on that show? We basically just, obviously, talk about the Toronto Raptors. and uh, It's a good title. Sh- good title for the show, by the way. I, yeah. Right to the point, eh? Right to the <laughs> point. <laughs> but what kinds of things? Um, do you analyze games? Are you analyzing just the... The state of the team on a weekly basis. Like how how often does the, the show come out? Uh, we try once a week. We're both disasters, so uh, it doesn't always work <laughs> out that way. But we, we try for once a week, um, and we our whole point is we never want to talk about like the actual basketball side of the game, unless it's like something very very tremendous or something very very awful, like. We all talk, we talk about like the culture around the team. You know what I mean? Like, oh, oh Demar Derozan's posting weird things on his Instagram. What does that mean? Uh, things like that. It's like very like socially and like pop culture based things around uh, my favorite basketball team. Okay, so you're not you're not. It's not a game by game analysis. You're just going no. through the culture. And so, 
Well, by the way, I mean, what do you make of DeMar DeRozan is now no longer on the team as we're speaking, unless he comes back by the time this goes live. Yeah. He, he, will not, he will not be back. Uh, no, it doesn't. Guarantee. Not under the current management. It doesn't seem that way. Uh, that yeah. was what did you make of that whole situation? We got Kawhi Leonard, but what do you make of that? I, so I'll put it in terms of uh, I'll, t- I'll tell you how we framed it in our podcast and, and, and I'll explain it to you that way. Um, so DeMar DeRozan is like my favorite Raptor of all time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Of all time. More than Vince Carter. Like he's the greatest person to put on a Raptors jersey. Wow. Huh. He deserves a statue. Uh, he he took our team from like garbage to like talked about. Like the, you know, he made himself into an all star. Uh, he's like a, an incredible. Like he he's a he's a basketball player that I'm like, oh, kids should look up to him. And I'm like, I would never say that. That's you know true. I mean? As a person, Children, yes, should look up to Demar Derozan as a human being and like follow that guy. That guy won't steer you wrong. He's a good dude. Um, dignity. He's got dignity. He's kind of a quiet, understated yeah. guy. And he integrity just yeah, doesn't absolutely. run his mouth. Uh, love that guy, man. Um, yeah, it's sad. I, I'm I'm quite sad about it, to be honest. The only Raptors team like player T shirt I have is a Demar Derozan T shirt. I, I he meant a lot to me too. Yeah, he's he best. means a lot to me. He's not gone. He's still he's going to do well, I think. And he will. That's he. Yeah. It, it, it actually is. It's a blessing in disguise for Demar Derozan to go to play with the greatest coach in the game, right? Absolutely. Like go, go learn. Yeah. Uh, that guy will will make you great. But we now have Kawhi Leonard. Okay, so I'll frame it in terms of the podcast. So sorry, um, go ahead. Yeah, how I said with Demar Derozan. That being said, how I feel about him. The last podcast of of the season. The title of that podcast was called Mister Regular Season, and I had to go back and listen to it, and it was basically me and Barry. So angry at Demar Derozan for the last two games of that Cleveland series. Well, he got benched in the second last game, right? Yeah, he got benched and then uh, he got ejected in the fourth yeah, one, right? Um, and I was like, this, and just his comments about how Le- uh, you know if LeBron wasn't here, we could win. I was like, okay, I was super, super, almost done with Demar Derozan. I'm like, this is it. This is as good as you're gonna get. We're never gonna beat. We're never going to get better than this. You're going to choke every playoff. Yeah. And then we traded for Kawhi Leonard, who's arguably the second best player in the game right now. Mm-hmm. And definitively the best Raptor. Wait a minute. You think Kawhi Leonard is better than, I assume the first is LeBron. Do you think Kawhi Leonard is better than Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, these kinds of guys? Yes. Okay. Interesting. Kawhi Leonard is already a Finals MVP and a champ. He won a Finals MVP at 22 and like Defensive Player of the Year. No, I'm not. I'm not doubting it necessarily. I'm just going by results. Yes, it's true. You're right. You're absolutely right. Those those stats are true. Uh, those yeah. distinctions are true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's top five. We'll say. Oh, the, oh, you're downgrading. Right See, I convinced you. I'm thinking, like, you know, there's a, there's a couple guys he's out a, there that you got to Westbrook, he's a, Harden. He's on our these TV. Guys. I know. No, I he, think he's fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I'm excited. I I texted our mutual friend James Keast as soon as it happened to be like, dude, what the hell? Yeah. So I yeah. I, I saw it coming too. That's all I'll say. But sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, no. Um, so I'm just like, yeah, man. If we 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 traded Demar for. That guy? Yeah, okay. I'm fine with that. That's when you do trade a guy like DeMar. You don't trade him for like multiple pieces. You sure. like that's go get a go get a goddamn superstar, which we've never had the likes of. Franchise player, absolutely. What about Casey though? What about the firing of of the coach Dwayne Casey at the same time? I think if Dwayne Casey had this team there with Kawhi Leonard, he would kill it, to be honest, to be honest with you. I think this team as constructed right now. Is perfect for Dwayne Casey. Do you do you think these decisions were fair given the season the Raptors had? Like the the fact that they more or less thought we got a clean house on some small level, they clamped house a little bit. Uh, I I do I do think it like you thought uh, it was necessary. I don't think it was necessary, but I, I understand why it had to happen, and something did have to happen. You know, when LeBron went to L.A., someone tweeted this was the greatest day in Raptors franchise history. I don't know. I don't know if it was one of you guys who did it. Actually, I saw it. And I thought, it might have been. We were very pumped that he he left. Um, yeah, the, East, left the Eastern East. Conference. Yeah, and, and and then a few weeks later, everything went to hell in terms of the Raptors. They all 
Well, maybe. Sorry, no. I guess Casey was already gone. I don't think. No, I don't think the Demar trade had happened. No, yet. yeah, no, so, Demar was there. That's right. Because the, Demar reacted to that too, and this is another reason. So after the trade happened, I think he did that interview. He did. I can't remember if it was uh, at the USA Basketball or if it was the um, the actual sit down one he did. But he definitely. He definitely said, oh, he, he, you know, it took him by surprise. The Raptors didn't tell him he was getting traded. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, you know, LeBron's out the East now. So I'm like, we had a, I'm like, the fact that you said that like multiple times that LeBron, this one man, really bothered me. And it bothered me for, for like a few years about DeMar DeRozan. Like, and, and he's just scared of LeBron James. But Nick, don't you, okay, again, James Keaston and I are talking before the Cavaliers Raptors series. And he's yeah. like, oh man, we're good. They got nothing. I was like, "Are you serious? They have LeBron. Like he's been to the, t- he's been to the finals like eight times in a row. Yeah. How can you discount this?" And he's like, "What? Who? What? Who are they going to get? They got nobody." I'm like, "I don't know, James. I'm, I, you know." And I watched every Raptor series. The Raptors and the Cavaliers each had sort of bad, uneven series the previous previous to meeting. And I was like, "I watched the Raptors." They don't have a killer. They don't have an assassin. They don't have someone who can shoot threes all of a sudden. Really, they don't. And I yeah. don't I don't I don't see this happening. And then the Raptors got swept by the Cavaliers. Yeah. And I know all you guys were heartbroken, but and it wasn't about me saying, haha, I was right. I was just like, I watched those games. I didn't think they had it in them. I didn't think they could beat LeBron. I and I and when you say just this one guy, you're now you're gonna be mad at me the way you're mad at DeMar DeRozan. But that guy <laughs> I've been watching LeBron play the whole time, you know, and I watched, I'm older than you. I watched Jordan play. I watched all these guys play on TV. And yeah. I'm telling you, like, I've never, we have, the greatest. I'm, I'm, ups, I was upset by the decision. I was upset when he went to Miami. I've been rooting against, I, when he went back to Cleveland, I, he kind of came back into my good graces yeah. watching him play. He's the smartest basketball player I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, and he knows the he knows the game. He knows the floor. He chokes sometimes, like he's a human being. Yeah, yeah. But Absolutely. my my goodness, like I did not. I was not at all. I saw that game one. They should have won, frankly. But the, aside from that, I just was like, once they lost game one, the way they lost it, the Raptors. I said, yeah, I, I, I think that I think the Cavs got it, and they did. And then, I mean, we all know what happened in the finals when they got there against Golden State. They in, in turn got swept, but still. That guy is ridiculous. So you, I think Demar has a point, and I understand what you're saying in terms of gamesmanship, and that's just not. Even if you're thinking that, he, you're saying he probably shouldn't be saying this stuff. Absolutely, because yeah. we're every. I'm sure everyone thinks that it's LeBron James. You don't go out and say that to your, to a fan base. Yeah, he. I remember. I don't know if it was this year, but last year, Demar's like, "I'll pay you a hundred bucks if anyone can tell me how to guard this guy." Is a joke. But you're like, you look at Boston Celtics. They're young kids. Jalen Brown was like, I'm mad that he's not in the East. I want, he's like, yo, we almost had that. Dude. Yes, exactly. He's not beating us this year. And I'm like, I want, I want that guy's attitude. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You're right. It's, it was, I think maybe DeMar became too Canadian. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Ish. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what happened. <laughs> he just be- went from Compton to like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. He became a Milton guy all of a sudden. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Uh, that LeBron guy's pretty good, eh? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> okay. Well, in any case, uh, this the series, the the podcast sounds sounds great. So you're gonna, what, is, is, you're saying you're off season right now, or are you, are you still doing it? Uh, it, it's off season, so it's very, very. It's whenever me and Barry wanna. Yeah. We have something that we want to talk about in the off season, but yeah, we're it gets better every season. We figure out more and more. This is, I think, this is season six now. We're going into. Oh, sweet. Okay. And so, uh, do you uh, did you activate the show when all this stuff went down with Demar? Like, you did an episode. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Absolutely, we did an episode, and that episode was uh, insane. And and uh, I actually shit on Demar and Rosen way more than we thought we were, going to <laughs> which was crazy. Are, is the is the Raptors organization sort of aware of your podcast? Yes, they're we're, we're hosted on like uh, the biggest fan Raptors fan site. Oh, which nice is Rap- Raptors Republic. So uh, we're sandwiched in between like super heavy basketball analysis and and. Uh, <laughs> And some of their readership don't know who we are once in a while, especially with the Kawhi uh, trade. So all these new people came over, oh, okay. and they're they're listening to their podcasts about you know Kawhi Leonard. She's 
you know, he shot 56% from the field. And, and then Mean Barrier talking about, like, ah, he's got cornrows still. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's very different. <laughs> very okay. different podcast. So people need to check out, uh, people listening to this podcast should check out Talking Raptors. It, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great show. Now, I want to ask you one last thing before we wrap up, because I understand you're, you're nominated for some kind of comedy award or you're trying to be nominated for a comedy award. What's going on? Uh, I'm in a, I'm in XM's top comic competition. I'm in the semifinals, and uh, I'm in the nightmare stage of my life where I have to beg people to vote for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're like a, pol- you're like a, a politician. Finals. You're like a politician, basically. Yeah, and this is it is honestly my nightmare to uh, <laughs> b- bother people and promote myself. Is something that I hate doing i always hate it i've refused to enter comedy competitions because i don't really believe in them um but this one is like the biggest one in canada uh what do you what do you get if you win you get twenty five thousand dollars and um spots at just for last toronto just for last montreal and just for last sydney australia Oh, there's a JFL in Sydney. I didn't know that. I know. I did. I, yeah, I think it's very. As of last year, it just started. So. Oh man, I got to review that one. I want to go to Sydney, Australia. Hell yeah! <laughs> I want to be on a plane for 36 hours or whatever it takes. <laughs> uh, so, you, uh, how do people vote for you? Uh, you go to what is it? SiriusXM. Like the, CA. The, okay, yeah. the website. Okay, and, and is there some? Uh, are they going to see a clip of you? Like, how is the vo- is the voting just done on reputation? Is there like some no, kind of no? There's you can watch my, which is my the only saving grace I have because I'm not like a, I don't got legions of fans, but I my my stand up is very funny and that is on the website and you get to watch everyone stand up and you get to vote for, you get to watch and vote for whoever you like best. Okay, all right, so people should go and vote for you to be uh, the, voted as the best comedian in Canada. What what else is coming up for you, Nick? Any, any plans? Any shows? Mm, lots of shows. I mean, shows all around Toronto. And you, I got a, filming a bunch of uh, weird sketches Oh, uh, to promote myself for this competition. So that's what I've been doing. Uh, and those are going to come out soon. Some, there's some weird ones, for sure. By the way, sorry, what is the vote, when is the voting deadline? Um, August 17th. People have to Voting vote. Voting is August seventeenth. Yeah. Okay, and then is then you determine if you're in the finals. We have to vote for you again. In the finals, no. That's I think it, I actually get to do stand up for like for money, which is the best. I'm like, yes, let me perform. Oh wait a minute. So uh, if we vote for you in the semifinals, and you and that works out. Do you is do you end up going to the final? Like I don't understand. Yeah. If so, yeah. so if you if I if I win, like I think it's the top six top, or top eight from this round. Top vote getters from this round go into the finals, and and the finals is just a show where you do ten minutes. Okay, great. Which, okay, which which I'm I I more I'm happy to do. <laughs> please please get me into the finals. Yeah, you just want to perform. Yeah, I don't want to beg for votes. It's crazy. It's just like doing stand up comedy. Okay, well I do hope people go vote for you, and I've already voted for you once. Apparently, I can vote multiple times. Is that what I heard? Oh yeah, you can vote every day and from every device you own, which is pretty insane okay it's okay i forgot to vote for myself twice already so <laughs> you mean you missed a couple of days or you just haven't yeah voted i missed i missed that i missed a full weekend and i was like perfect that's not good put it in your phone alarm everyone just vote for nick like every morning that should be your how you wake up oh, i gotta vote for nick <laughs> until august 17th okay so where can people learn more about you in the uh in the on the computers on their phones where where would you send people um, I would send people to like my Instagram or Twitter, but everything is at Nick Reynoldson, Nick Reynoldson.com at Nick Reynoldson on Instagram at Nick Reynoldson on, on Twitter. Okay. Your website is Nick Reynoldson.com. Yeah. Okay. And do you have, are there any recordings, Nick? Um, I like, like, do I have an album? Out yeah. Yeah. Or, I'm so I'm, I'm working on it and okay. I'm very far behind on it, but. I, I ask for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, to promo something and plug something. But also, normally at the end of a, a music interview or even a comedian interview, I'll ask someone if we can go to a track so people can hear some stand-up or hear a song. But you don't have something like that I can go to right now. Is that what you're saying? That's 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 what I'm saying. I just got YouTube. Play. I got my Sirius XM Top Comic uh, video you play that <laughs> do you want me to play that i can play that i can i can yeah. i can capture it how do i find you, you'll tell me after tell me how to find it i'll find it i'll rec- i'll capture it and then i'll put it on the show and and do you do you want to tell us what that is about 
if if I, if I can find it. Do you the want to stand-up just, set? Yeah, you yeah, want to absolutely. contextualize it? What, what, what did you do? Um, it's actually, uh, we covered it, a lot of it in our conversations. It's about me being mixed, and also uh, I talk about my bird in that. So Okay, your bird. I, I mean, it comes back to the bird. Yeah. It all comes it back all, to the It bird. always does. That bird is hopefully is going to win me $25,000. Okay. <laughs> That's what you want out of a bird. You want to leverage yeah. it for money somehow. Yeah, well, pay, pull, you got to pull your weight, CC. It's about time. You're going to be alive for another 30, 40 years. I have not had as extensive an avian conversation on the show. As I have today, it's it's a lot of bird stuff, and I did not expect that. Okay, this is uh, this is Nick Reynoldson doing some stand up. Uh, Nick, uh, thank you so much for your time today and being on this show. It's always fun to talk to you. I wish you the best luck with everything going forward. Thanks so much, Vish. I thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it, dude. Please welcome to stage a very funny, the hilarious Nick Reynoldson. <laughs> What's up, guys? Uh, listen, I know I look like SiriusXM sponsored a child. I understand that. Let's get, let's get that out the way. Like, I look like I came with the venue. You know what I mean? Like, like, like when they sign the lease, like, by the way, there's a kid in the basement. You got to feed him. And I come out nighttime and I clean shit. <laughs> it's okay, guys. I know I look fucked up. Uh, so, <laughs> some of you guys look fucked up, too. You know what I mean? Oh, do you think we're all tens here in this basement? Is that what we thought? Good for you guys. I admire your confidence. Um, but I'm going to tell you why I look like this, guys. It's because I'm mixed. <laughs> and you know when they're always like, oh, mixed kids are always good looking? <laughs> Sometimes you get a bad mix, you know what I mean? It's not always science. And people fucking guess when you look like this, but we're in Canada, so everyone's, like, really polite about it all the time. They're, all, they're always like, hey, man, do you like burritos? <laughs> or shawarmas, which one is it? I know it's an ethnic rap of some sort. <laughs> but my mom's from Guyana, uh, and my dad's from Canada, so when a brown lady and a white man, you know? have sex <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> and I don't know why I came out like a gay Mexican dude with a shitty haircut I don't know <laughs> do you guys know what's fucked up about that joke is I control the haircut part this was <laughs> this... <laughs> I was like yeah give me what lesbians liked in 2014 I want that shit I want people to be confused when they look at me <laughs> I want someone that's high at the back, like, this Chinese girl is hilarious. I love this. <laughs> it's weird when you grow up mixed, though, because when you grow up mixed, you don't know what the fuck you are. You know what I mean? Like, I was never Guyanese enough to be Guyanese, but I was never, like, white enough to be a white guy. I was always in, like, beige limbo. You know, so <laughs> someone accept me, right? <laughs> and literally, when I was growing up, I used to think it was just me and my brother as our own race. I'm like, we got to get more members. We're not going to make it like, <laughs> like, do I look healthy? <laughs> if I catch the flu, that's 50% of our population gone. <laughs> How the fuck did we start off in danger? Give us a chance. <laughs> like, I look like Mark Anthony took that divorce from J-Lo hard as fuck. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's in a comedy competition now. Jesus. Do you guys ever look back in your life and try to figure out where it went wrong? <laughs> yeah, right? Like, I'm like, why am I competing for money and not a doctor? You know what happened to me? I know what went wrong, though. You guys remember when you are a kid and everyone's getting their first pets and shit? Everyone's getting, like, dogs and cats, right? My parents bought us a bird. <laughs> Nobody wants to hang out with the bird guy. I'm um, this guy? <laughs> No one wants to hang out with that fucking guy. And birds are terrifying. I don't know why the fuck you would ever get a bird. Like, birds don't even look at you like normal creatures. Like, they look at you... Birds look at you like this shit. Like, like they already got a problem with your lifestyle and shit. Why would you bring that in the house? 
And it's a parrot. It's going to live like 95 years. This goddamn... Like, my parents are going to die. I don't want this fucking bird, guys. <laughs> and it's an asshole. And like, growing up, everyone's like, oh, man, you got a parrot that's so cool. Does he talk? No. <laughs> He's an asshole. You know what he learned to do? Mimic the sound of the microwave. That's what he learned to do. <laughs> it's just constantly beep, 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 beep. You're like, how many pizza pops did I put in this shit? Does your bird talk? No. You want to know what else my bird learned to do? Mimic the sound of doors opening. Like a fucking psychopath. You know how many times I've been high by myself at home? <laughs> Watching TV, all you hear is, I'm gonna get murdered! How many fucking doors are in this house? Beep, 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 beep. Who put that in there? I'm starving, thank God. And I remember the day it happened. Like, I remember my mom coming home. She's like, I got a bonus today at work. So that means we can get a computer. Or a parrot. <laughs> and I thought she was joking because we didn't own a computer at the time. So I come home excited and walk in the door. Bacock! Are you fucking serious, lady? Like, you know I'm going to have to write a resume at some point in my life. You know I can't use Excel to this day. I don't know what a spreadsheet is because we've got a fucking parrot. You guys know how hard it is to watch porno on a typewriter? Do you understand how hard that is? You gotta do open bracket, period, close bracket, open bracket, period, close bracket. And you're only at the titties, it's a lot of work. And I was just more mad at my mom. I'm like, why the fuck are those the only two options? How could it be paired to computer? How about vitamins for me? Do I look like I'm doing okay, mom? How about another round of groceries? That would've helped me out quite a bit. Uh, thank you guys so much, man. Nick Reynoldson! Give it up for Nick! Best of luck to Nick Reynoldson with this SiriusXM Top Comic Search Contest thing, and, and thanks to Nick for appearing on this, the 417th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms, and also on things like Spotify, YouTube, and Audio Boom as well. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for on any of those platforms, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, at Vish Creative, or follow me, at Vishkana. Listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time, around the world at cfru.ca, or on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. Thanks again to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts for their in-kind support of this show. Also, my friend Jim Guthrie for letting me use the instrumental version of his song, The Rest Is Yet to Come. Every week I end the show with that song. You're hearing it right now. Now, jimguthrie.org for more information about Jim and his amazing work. And uh, thanks once again to you for listening to this show all the time, (laughs) reviewing it, rating it, downloading episodes of the show, subscribing to the podcast, and spreading the word about it. I'm doing the best I can. You're doing the best you can. We're all just doing the best we can. Let's keep doing the best we can. I will talk to you soon. Goodbye for now.